Good morning, everybody, and thank you so much for being here today. It is really, really good to see you and so many of you interested in today's critical and pressing topic, mental health and supporting each other through its challenges. When uh, Sarah and Grace came to Senior Leadership Council a semester or so ago to present the data on mental health on our campus, other campuses, but on our campus in particular, um, we all agreed that we had to prioritize this concern on our campus. That it could no longer simply remain a concern, but that we had to arm ourselves with data and knowledge to make a difference in the lives of our students, colleagues, family, and of course ourselves. At the University of Michigan Dearborn, we are equipped to make a difference, to lend a hand, to discuss, to support, but also to just listen and empathize. And the panelists today will show you how well equipped we are. The group of experts today are from a variety of units and departments from across our own very, uh, our very own campus. They, all of them, have enthusiastically accepted my invitation to be part of this panel and share their knowledge. And I really want to thank them. It's a busy part of the semester with grading, finalizing their classes, working with students. Um, so thank you so much for being here and for taking the time. So let me introduce them to you and then you will see that the slides will also uh, tell you a little bit about themselves. And uh, I want to also thank from the bottom of my heart, Professor Lisa Martin for agreeing, uh, actually for, for offering to MC the event, so thank you. So Professor Grace Holmes Kotrick, um, Professor Nehal Patel, Director of CAPS, Sarah, and Sarah, I always not mispronounce your last name, so is it Bicek? Bicek, Oh, yeah. Bicek, wow, okay. Uh, <laughs> Professor Finn Bell, Professor Lisa Martin, Professor Caleb Seifert, Professor Amy Brainer, and Professor Patrick Bouchet. Thank you again for being here, all of you, and I'm going to let Lisa start with the presentation. Thank you so much, Provost Scarlatta. All right, um, I'm going to turn it over to our first speaker, Grace, who is going to kick us off with a video that was made by several of our students as just an extra credit project in <laughs> Professor um, in Natalie's uh, community organizing class, they just kind of came to her one day and said, we did this project in the library one day and sent us this video and we thought it would be the perfect piece to just start this event. I guess for I guess maintaining my mental health, I try to balance spending time with friends and connecting like, closely with them, and also having time just to myself to I guess think and process. Usually, what I do is I like to listen to music, just kind of like distract myself from whatever's going on, and I also like to hang out with my dog and just like pet and play with him, uh, just like hang out with him, I guess. <laughs> What I do to focus on my mental health is uh, get my priorities straight and make sure that my mind is where it needs to be instead of focusing on things that really won't matter in like a week, a month, or a year. So something that I like to do is simply like at the end of the day I always like to write in my journal just to like help reflect on my day and just like visualize what I need to do and like you know it just helps me relax if that makes sense like just journaling. So when I'm uh, stressed with classes what I like to do is uh, go to sleep, watch some anime, that calms me down. So watching that video helps us see a few examples of students' own coping techniques, taking care of themselves and, and how they're doing that on their own. Um, I'm going to invite us all into a wellness practice right now, just to start off this event focused on our own well-being. And uh, we'll just do, uh, or I'll invite you to do, about a three-minute mindfulness meditation with me. Uh, so all are invited to practice. If for any reason you would rather observe or just sit and take three minutes to do nothing, um, I invite you to do that too. So it's a, an optional practice. 
uh, and, uh, and a secular practice and, and really um, available to anyone. So we'll start out moving into a grounded posture, meaning that our bodies feel connected to the chair and the floor, noticing that your feet are fully planted on the ground, feeling the bottoms of your feet there, and that your body is being held by the chair, noticing that you are supported. As we're sitting, expanding upward toward the ceiling, stretching the spine tall so that we're in an upright position, and then with an exhale, allowing the shoulders to fall, allowing the arms to hang heavy at the sides, allowing the hands to rest in the lap. And you can let your eyes close if that feels comfortable, or you can simply lower your gaze. Taking a few mindful breaths here, meaning that we're breathing with awareness Breathing in, I know I'm breathing in. And breathing out, I know I'm breathing out. Noticing how it feels to take a few conscious breaths. These may be our first conscious breaths of the day. How does it feel to breathe in, in this moment, in this body, in this place? As we feel the sensation of breath in the body, we may notice that it's cool as the air comes in, warm as the air goes out. We may notice the sensation of the chest and belly expanding and contracting. Allowing our attention to rest for these moments on breathing. Allowing ourselves to let go of the to-do lists and the external demands. Right now, we're just breathing. Taking a few more breaths here as we begin to wrap up. Maybe they're deeper breaths, full breaths, fully expanding the chest and belly fully exhaling until you can no longer exhale. And to close our practice, I'm going to ring a bell. See if you can shift your attention to focus entirely on the sound of the bell letting your attention rest on the bell until you can no longer hear it, and that will conclude our practice. So taking a moment, a slow moment, to return to the space around us. So we bring our eyes back up and look around the room. Looking around you, even behind you, can help to reorient your nervous system to the safety of the space we're in right now. Even in a short meditation like that, just a few minutes, we can go pretty deep. It can happen quickly. So uh, giving yourself the time to come back. That's a, a short practice. It's a mindful breathing practice. You can use any time to help yourself ground. Uh, by ground, I mean to allow your nervous system to settle. It can be especially helpful right now if you're feeling stressed in your daily life uh, and, and to do it regularly throughout the day. So it's one tool that I offer my students in uh, the stress management course that I teach. I've been teaching that course um, 
uh, in the Department of Health and Human Services now for three and a half years. So just a reminder, I'm Grace. There are a lot of us up here. So my name is Grace helms Cotri, and I'm a lecturer in Health and Human Services. Um, and this course that I've been getting to teach now uh, for a number of years, uh, focusing on stress management, is an invitation to students to reflect on their own lives and where stress exists in their lives, to identify their, their habitual reactions to stress, and to identify their coping strategies, and then to determine which of those are serving them and which are not, and to make a stress management plan for themselves. So in that course, you know, over three and a half years, every term, I've seen a lot of students come through, and I've gotten to hear from them directly about the stress that they're experiencing, and it's a lot. I imagine that we know that, um, and you know, some of us here are, are faculty and staff, and some are students, and so you know, there's an awareness, I think, in general, that students are holding a lot. And so are faculty and staff. So in this course that, that, um, where we're examining stress, I invite students to focus on what we can do personally. Absolutely, there are things we can do. We can use tools like mindfulness meditation uh, and many others uh, to help ourselves relate to stress more skillfully. Mitigate stress. Can't eliminate it, but mitigate stress in our lives to some extent. At the same time that we're doing that, Throughout my course, I invite students to zoom out to see the bigger picture. So we can't only be focusing on our own individual efforts to manage stress. We have to see the bigger picture of where stress exists in our lives and what's causing it. We can address those issues too to some extent. So I want to invite us into a short, just a three minute activity where we are uh, zooming out a little bit. And this is what I do with my students as well. Uh, so imagining that you have a, a nice camera, I don't have one quite like this, but a nice camera that has a zoom lens on it, and you're, uh, you're zoomed in all the way up close to an individual student. So maybe it's a student you have right now, maybe it's yourself, uh, and you see that one student up close, and you can see that they are holding so much academically in terms of work responsibilities, uh, transportation issues, caregiving responsibilities, uh, all of the things that they have to manage in their daily lives. They're holding a lot. And they're trying to be well. They're doing all they can to be well, right? Working hard to be well on top of everything else. And they're you know, succeeding in some ways and failing in others, just like all of us, right? So zoom out then a little bit to the next level, and we can see all of the relationships that surround this student. So imagining it like a web. And the student is in the center, and, and there are these offshoots, all of these um, lines connecting to the student's friends and family and peers and uh, advisors and, and administrators and faculty uh, and, and all of the people in their lives. That web includes a lot of people who are nourishing to the student, who support them, who help to mitigate their stress in daily life, as well as those who, who don't, who actually maybe cause more stress or even create harm in their lives. And then some folks who are in more neutral category, right? So we see all of those relationships surrounding the student. Then we zoom out again to another level, and we see the institutions that student's a part of. Institution of U of M Dearborn, right? The institutions maybe where they work, organizations they're a part of, even broader institutions like the Institution of Healthcare in the US, the Institution of Housing. They have to relate with all of those institutions, relate to all those institutions in their daily lives. And we can imagine there are ways in which the policies and practices of those institutions support their well-being, enhance their well-being. And then there are a lot of ways that those institutions don't or actually create harm, right? And then we zoom out one final level with our camera lens and we can see even a bigger picture. We can see the social, political, and economic context in which our students live and, and exist and survive or thrive or a combination of those things. And if we're thinking about that broader context, we're talking about systems in the United States like racism and white supremacy, like classism and the way that capitalism creates extreme economic inequities, um, patriarchy, heterosexism. We're talking about systemic oppression. We're also talking about, so those are systems of harm, systems of healing, subcultures of healing, and ways that students are opting into those. So that much broader context Zooming all the way back into our student, now we can maybe see better, maybe for some of us it helps us to see better, that that student cannot ever be isolated from all of those other things. That those elements of context and those other systems, those layers, 
are part of the student's daily moment-to-moment -moment life and cannot be removed. So if I'm talking to a student about managing stress, absolutely we can talk about on the personal level. There are things you can do for personal stress management and self-care and those are critical and you must choose ones that work for you and use them to keep yourself well. And we need to talk about your relationships. And we need to talk about your institutions. And we need to talk about the broader context within which you find yourself and how we can relate to those things and stay well and how we can advocate for those things to help us be well. So, you know, from our standpoint here at the university as an institution, we have some power, those of us in positions of power, faculty and staff, or, and, and students to some extent as well, we have the ability to examine institutionally how are we impacting a student's well-being through the practices and policies uh, that, that exist and have just existed for a long time, those that we're creating anew, those that we're revising, revisiting, how can we create well-being through those mechanisms uh, and see students as you know, whole beings within a, a whole system, a complex system. Uh, so I believe that others on the panel are going to talk about that more. Uh, and I've used up, you know, if we add in the meditation, more than my time. So I'm going to go ahead and pass it on to, uh, I think Sarah is next, yeah? Okay. Is that right? Caleb is next. Okay, so thank you all. Do we know where the... All right, Terry's going to manage the slides. All right, so I'm Caleb Seifer, and I'm a clinical psychologist, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about feeling bad better <clears throat> is a secret to actually living good. So I'm gonna give one very concrete piece of advice that's very actionable today, but I'm also gonna talk a bit about the big picture, and to get to my concrete advice, I need to get to the big picture. <laughs> the big picture is, why do people go to therapy in the first place? Um, well, when folks walk through my office door, they say a lot of things to me, but I can boil it down to, they say, doctor, I want a good life. And why I'm here is I don't feel good. And I know that feeling good is an important part of a good life. And folks, I'm here to tell you, they're not wrong. At the same time, if, when you live in a Western culture, one message that you're uh, exposed to frequently, for many reasons I'm not gonna get into, is not just that you can feel good, but you should feel good, because you can always feel good all the time. If you're not currently feeling good, you're doing something wrong. And this suggests to people that a life without stress is possible, but I'm here to tell you a life without stress would be horrible, because that would be a meaningless life. So when people walk through my door, a part of what they're saying is true. They do need to learn how to feel good. As they start to let go of this idea that they always can feel good, they can start to ask a new question, which is, how can I feel bad better? Which is a question that many of us don't ask. Okay, one way that we can feel bad is stress. Stress researchers will tell you, stress involves a combination of thoughts, feelings, physiological states, and behaviors. Now, when it comes to the kind of stresses our ancestors face, and sometimes we face when walking in the woods like a bear, uh, this system works phenomenally well. And so what will happen is when you see a bear, you will think, I'm in danger. Um, you will think, you will feel a lot of tension in your body, and you will uh, want to get out of the situation. And all this is highly adaptive, and that's what our stress system is designed to do, and it does this very well. But when you're dealing with modern day stressors, like exams, like having to grade, <laughs> like ongoing stressors such as financial difficulties or what we've all been through recently, the pandemic, this system is not ideal. It will flood you with stress hormones and often there is no reaction that you can take to make this go away. Therapists working with people in these types of situations are gonna focus exactly as was stated earlier and exactly as the student said on behavioral responses that will help people cope. When you come to therapy with ongoing stressors, we're gonna push you to identify resources in your life that can help you. We're gonna work with you on, on basic self-care. Are you exercising? Are you dieting? And absolutely, we're gonna, as Grace says, we're gonna talk about how can you use mindfulness and how can you use social support to help you. Now, even though I'm gonna focus more on 
your thinking today, I want to make crystal clear that a lot of other people are going to focus on this, and this is necessary. Research will show you that people who do more of these things, especially when exposed to stressors, will have less stress hormones in their system and will cope more adaptively. However, our thoughts matter. Our thoughts matter. The brain is developed to tell stories. It does many things, but one of the things it's adapted to do is to explain things. If you are in a culture that tells you you should feel good all the time and you're currently feeling stressed, your brain is to tell you a story about why that is. And that story for a lot of people goes like this. I'm stressed because I'm failing. And I'm failing because I'm incapable. And the situation I'm in is bigger than me and I cannot manage it. And that means I'm in tremendous danger. And when we think about our stress this way, it amplifies our stress response. This is Richard Lazarus. If you want to know more about the research in this area, please email me. I'm going to go through this very quickly. Dr. Lazarus and his colleague Susan Folkman did an experiment where they put you in a stressful situation and they asked you to think about how this is dangerous to you. And what they found is when people did that, they coped more poorly, they released more stress hormones, they had more inflammation in their body, and they felt worse. But they also had people look at their stress as not danger, but discomfort, opportunities for growth. When people referred to their stress as a challenge, they managed better. When they saw opportunities in it, they managed better. But we have to be very careful at this point. I started this talk by saying, feel bad better. And you might have just mistakenly heard me say, just think happy thoughts about your stress, and it all goes away. So instead, I'm going to suggest that we don't try to make our stress go away. Instead, we embrace behavioral strategies, but to get ourselves to initiate them. Often, students know what to do. You, you saw the video. But initiating it is a whole different matter. And sometimes how we can initiate it is we can use an and statement. And statements acknowledge bad feelings is real. They recognize that feeling bad can say something good about ourselves or about our life. And finally, they accept that feelings aren't either or. You can feel good and bad at the same time. When students graduate, they regularly experience this. I want to give you some examples of and statements that um, apply to what I'm going through right now. So what I have here is examples of stress statements that I experienced today and one from the past, and then how I try to use and to deal with it. The first one is, I'm anxious about this presentation and worry about how I'll be evaluated. And that's absolutely true. <clears throat> and at the same time, a part of what this reflects is, I care about what my colleagues think about me because I'm fortunate enough to work with colleagues that I respect, and not everybody gets that opportunity. I'm also nervous that I won't have the impact I want, and later I'll feel like I've failed or I've let myself down. And at the same time, tolerating that allows me to, it puts me in touch with I care about people and accepting that I might fail is an opportunity to practice. You might not be able to help every moment, maybe you can help someone. When I was a student, I wanted to say at least one from a student perspective, I often felt on edge and like I didn't know how to write the papers. When students are experiencing this, something that they can say to themselves is, and part of why this is stressful to me is I'm pushing myself out of my comfort zone in college. And this is an opportunity, whether I succeed or fail, to get some feedback and to grow. The stress is temporary. The growth could be permanent. To sum up, the desire for a good life requires us to learn how to feel good. And it requires us to learn how to feel bad better. In order to feel bad better, you absolutely need to use the type of behavioral techniques that a lot of other folks are going to focus on today. At the same time, using and statements and reframing your situation can get you to initiate those techniques. And statements will not take away bad feelings, but they will provide one avenue through which you might be able to feel better about the bad feelings that you have. Thank you. Hope this has been helpful. Thank you so much. All right, turn it over to Sarah. All right, thank you. Let's hope that the slides behave because I have slides where they're going to show pictures. So thank you all for letting me come in. I am going to talk a little bit more about the research here, what our students at U of M Dearborn are experiencing. Mind you, the presentation um, that was referred to earlier takes usually about a half hour, so I'm going to do this very quickly, okay? So next slide. Well, next slide, too. 
So um, I'm going to go over the Healthy Minds data, which we have four years worth of data. It is the most nationally recognized um, survey for college students' mental health. Um, and I will kind of show that there are the differences amongst the years, how CAPS has responded to this data, and then quickly, very quickly, recommendations. All right, next slide. I already went through that. We're good. All right, so here's some of the cross-year comparison. There is a lot of data each year. The Healthy Mind Survey gives us about 300 pages worth of just data on our students' mental health and well-being. So this snapshot that I'm giving all of you today is by far a small fraction of the data we have. So if anyone is interested in this, please, please um, feel free to contact me. But you can kind of see here, these were questions that were asked to students of how you're feeling in the last two weeks here at U of M Dearborn in the 2017-18 year, 18-19, 19-20, and then again in 2021. So just because of the way that we actually collected this data, we can see what impact COVID had really on our students' mental health and well-being. And I know a lot of the times we talked about how that was really difficult. And I, I do believe it was really difficult, but you don't see that those changes in our number with our students. And I think that the reason why is that our numbers are really high to begin with. Um, when you look at the data, we can compare it to other universities. We're some of the highest um, on a lot of these questions. So I think the reason we didn't see a big impact, like has been talked about, um, was just because of those numbers being so high. So that first column there has had little um, interest or pleasure in doing things. Second one is felt down, depressed, or helpless. Um, felt tired or had little energy is that third column. And the fourth one is felt nervous, anxious, or on edge. So you can see our students are struggling. Next slide. Here's some more, and I'm going to have to stand up. I'm so used to walking around while presenting that I have to be able to stand up. I'm sorry. I'm going to break the, the pattern here. This one here is engaging in non-suicidal self-injury in the past year, showing about 20% of our students, so about one in five in our students have experienced that. Um, experienced suicidal ideation in the last year. Again, anywhere from 11% to 16%, depending on the year. Received mental health therapy in the last year, only in the 20s to 30s. So we're seeing these other numbers being a lot higher, right? So the need is still there. Having a lifetime diagnosis of mental health disorder, again, closer to the people who are actually going to therapy. And then this one, admitting I have a current need for therapy. 77% was the most recent number, but yet yeah, only 22% was receiving that. Next slide. Here's just some more information we are able to tabulate within the Healthy Minds if a person would actually be diagnosed based on um, the information they are giving us with certain diagnoses. This first one is uh, how many individuals that responded to the survey actually meet the qualifications for currently experiencing a major depressive episode. This one is, has depression overall, so it could qualify in the numerous different categories related to depression, almost half of our students having that. Um, anxiety disorders, about 34%, and eating disorders, about 10% of our students. And you can see this big number here, anywhere between 72 and 83% say that, yeah, what I'm experiencing definitely has a negative impact on my mental health um, and academic um, success as well. And this number, which I'm always so sad about as the director of PAPS, that only about 60% of our students who self-responded to a survey about mental health knew we existed on campus. Although that is higher than before, it still shows we have a long way to go. Next slide. This, I think, is something that's also really unique here for U of M Dearborn and important for all of us to be able to think about, is one of the reasons that people often talk about about not coming into therapy is the stigma associated with it. This number here answers the question, if I went to therapy, or if your friend went into therapy, would you look at them differently? And sadly, still, 5 to 7% of our students said yes. So they actually hold stigma about mental health services. But then there's this belief here that, yeah, if I went to therapy, people would judge me differently. The majority of our students are very close to believe that that's the case. When the reality is the majority of our students would not judge each other. But that stigma still exists and stops people from walking into our door. Next slide. So this kind of gives you some information just very briefly about what CAPS data has looked like. We've seen an increase in the number of unique, unique students coming in every year, except for that year where we were 100% remote. And I do not think that was because students weren't struggling. We see from the winter 2021 data that they were, but I think it goes to the unique nature of our students. The majority of them are commuter students who are living at home. If you are now at home, unable to come to CAPS, and your issue is related to your family, are you going to have a session with them the next wall over? No. 
So I think a lot of our students struggled in, like, on their own in isolation. Um, during that time and that is why I think we saw that huge increase as soon as we started offering in person or zoom room for students And I ran the data before I came here today And we are definitely on track to break that record which was our highest amount of students and appointments given um, Last year this year Next slide So what we've been trying to do with all this data Well, we've been trying to go out and do presentations like I'm doing here today to get this information out there in the hands of people um, but also trying to create cross-cultural teams to implement some of the recommendations received from Healthy Minds and Jed. So if any of you are here interested in working on more wellness work, please let me know. Um, we would be glad to connect you with the Wellness um, Collaborative, which is made up of students, staff, and faculty who work on more of that preventative nature related to mental health. Uh, we've done more outreaches and liaisons to different academic departments, recognizing getting information in the hands of faculty especially is really important. As the survey showed, next to their peers, students are most likely to talk to faculty about their mental health struggles. Um, we do QPR training for faculty, staff, and students related to suicide prevention, but really those skills learned during that presentation could really help with all mental health struggles. We also have an after-hour service that we implemented, recognizing you know, people might struggle on the weekend or after five o'clock or during breaks when they're at home and they need to be able to talk to a quality level clinician. And so if our students call that after hour numbers, that's an extension of us at CAPS. It is a licensed mental health clinician answering that phone number who then gets in contact with me as the director to follow up with them the next business day to create that wraparound care. We do Wellness Wednesday emails that go out to any student, staff, or faculty who are interested. Um, there's also the Silver Cloud app that is free for anyone with a UMICH email that helps you really be able to look at your own wellness and mental health. We created a YouTube playlist connected to the university's YouTube channel. Again, during that time of COVID, recognizing our students were still struggling, but we may not have had those individual appointments. We started doing presentations and putting them online and saw a huge increase of students actually watching them, really kind of backing up that they were struggling, but they could stick in their ear pods and listen to a presentation on what to do more than be able to go to a Zoom meeting. We also mentioned earlier that they're more likely to talk to peers first, right? So we created a program called the Mental Health and Wellness Peer Educators where we actually hire eight to 10-ish students here at U of M Dearborn and provide them a pretty extensive training on how to be able to help support their peers. And they do wellness tables, they do support groups, really be able to try to get that information out there because students might be more likely to go talk to another student before they come to my office. And we also just started doing psychological assessments, recognizing again that there might be students who have undiagnosed um, impairments just because they've never really gotten in front of a psychologist. And those are, especially for those in the clinical field, super expensive to get and very rarely covered from insurances. So you're really excited to finally be able to offer that to students. Next slide. We also have a commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion, recognizing we have a diverse campus that has a lot of unique variables and we want to be able to make sure that we are always staying in touch and aware of where we need to do to be able to help support our campus best. Um, new or coming soon <laughs> this semester is we started doing some mental health Instagram messaging and also on the weekly Dean of Students email there's always information about mental health. Recognizing that it's important to have information come from everywhere so that students are getting this information. So next time we do this survey, hopefully the number will be higher than 60% being aware that we exist. We also started a psychiatric partnership with University Health Services, recognizing that students might have barriers to getting psychiatric services. Maybe they're underinsured, maybe they're insured but under their parents' insurance and their parents are not supportive of mental health treatment. And so this is a way for students to connect with CAPS to get free services without even having to drive to Ann Arbor. They can if they choose. But they can just come to our Zoom room and log in and see the psychiatrist that's in Ann Arbor without having to ever leave campus here. And then starting hopefully next week, actually, because <laughs> they just completed this past Saturday their, their final test, we'll have a therapy dog in the office two days a week. So yeah, super excited to have Moses on campus soon. There'll be announcements for that. Yes, you can come on over right next door. All right, next slide. And then last, what are some recommendations? Things like this, you know, involvement of the entire campus community, campus-wide strategic planning, be able to recognize that this is an important thing, not just for CAPS to go and talk about, but for everyone to talk about and everyone to play a role in our students and campus mental health. Additional support for faculty and staff. You know, one of the biggest challenges we have is when we do events like this, it's the people who have an interest, who are aware a lot of times that this is a problem, which is great. We want to give you all the resources, 
But what about those who don't yet recognize? How do we get this information to them and help them be able to see that this is something that their students in their classrooms or in their advising sessions are struggling with? Doing more cross-campus campaigns to help identify um, students who might be feeling isolated. So using things like the CARE Report more so that we really can be able to wrap the resources that we have on campus around our students to help them be successful. Um, implementing more mental health campaigns, some more wellness day activities, and then for all those faculty out there, being aware that CAPS also has a ton of resources for how no matter what your field is, you can implement mindfulness practices, mental health awareness into your topics too. So again, that was my spiel very quickly. If you ever have more questions, please feel free to reach out. Thank you, Sarah. All right, Amy. Can faculty visit the dog? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> you can even reserve the dog so you oh have them come God. to your classroom. So okay. we're super yeah. excited. Great news. So um, I'm Amy Brainer. I'm in Women and Gender Studies and LGBTQ Studies. And I'm going to organize my comments around three very short conversations. The first is one that I put in the abstract for this talk. Self-care is the new pull yourself up by your bootstraps. I wrote that this simple statement is a smart critique. It points out the commercialization of self-care, the stratification of mental health services, and the fact that people are often blamed for their own mental health outcomes. This critique, I think, is well covered by other folks on this round table. The second conversation occurred at a conference I recently attended. The panel was about queer survival, and the last paper on the panel was about queer mentoring, something personally very close to my heart. The conference was in Mexico City, and the paper was in Spanish uh, with interpreters on site. Many students from the local universities attended. During the Q&A, one of the students raised his hand and said, paraphrasing in translation, going to school has been so difficult. My experiences in the university have been so painful. Finding you, indicating his queer classmates and teacher who was present, changed everything. It is you who have kept me here. As queer people, we understand that here does not just mean in this room or in this university. In many cases, it means in this world. The student began to cry. Soon, a majority of people in the room were crying. Many went on to share similar things. The third conversation was at the Chancellor's Luncheon with our recent guest speaker, Dr. Desmond Patton. We talked about the essential work that mentoring provides, especially for black faculty and other faculty and students of color. At one point, I said something like, there is no place to put that in the portal. For students who haven't had the pleasure, by portal, I mean the place where faculty delineate our accomplishments at the end of the year, highlighting especially grants, research papers, and other scholarly activities. I kept thinking about this after lunch. What, in fact, would go in the portal? Certain aspects of mentoring can be highlighted, but community is not a metric. I thought about my experiences of community on campus. As long as the withdrawal of family support remains common for LGBTQ people, we will continue to stand in for absent kin. How should I quantify these requests? Will you help me do my taxes? Can I just sit in your office sometimes with you and do my homework there? I think I'm being discriminated against at work. What should I do? I left home last night. I might need somewhere else to live. Do I include only the hours we spend talking in person? What about the hours washing dishes and lying awake at night thinking of ways to meet someone's needs? The daily messages to say, how are you holding up? This is not measurable. You can't put love in an annual report. And yet this is what sustains us. And I really mean us. This is not unidirectional support from faculty and staff to students. I, too, am part of this community. I, too, check the mental health boxes that keep getting associated with us on paper. 
I know how it feels to sit in the emergency waiting room, to sign in under surveillance at a low budget inpatient mental health center, attending a loved one through another preempted exit strategy. I know the slow grinding halt of depression on a cellular level and just how much work it takes to decide to live. I also know the joy of us. I too feel better when there is another queer person in the room, the feeling of home their presence brings. Queer culture is a home making culture. Our lineage is one of adoption. And so this love is not limited to people under the endlessly proliferating acronym. Anyone whose family is not there, whose value is not recognized is part of this community I'm talking about. I recently wrote a chapter on queer families of origin and choice under the conditions of social distancing and lockdown. The chapter delves into these conditions here at U of M Dearborn. It is also global in scope, and I looked at the evidence emerging from many cultures and places. What I found were hundreds of testimonies of care. Queer people sharing housing and food, attending each other through sickness, grieving deaths, providing support as larger numbers of people than usual were outed to family members and harassed or assaulted by them, visiting one another in jails and prisons, providing legal representation under conditions of state violence. Emotional labor was also important. Across every indicator, age, gender, class, race, religion, the desire to be with other queer people was palpably strong. So strong, it surprised even me. As I wrote in the chapter, finding other queers is not a luxury, it's a life skill. In class next week, my students and I will read an article by Ina Micheli titled Self-Care an act of political warfare or a neoliberal trap. In this article, the author analyzes the ways that self-care has been privatized and depoliticized, the bootstraps model, if you will. But she doesn't leave us there, nor does she believe that this model of care and well-being has to be the dominant one. She traces clearly the origins of self-care in African, indigenous, and other women of color organizing. There is in this activism an intergenerational precedent for care as a collective responsibility. Sharing the burdens of everyday life is inextricable from movements to end state-sponsored violence or change the society in some larger way. I want to end with an observation that is itself a whole talk, or maybe many talks. I hope it provides some food for thought. The literature is absolutely abundantly clear that connections to each other are necessary for mental, emotional, spiritual, and physical health. Given such, we need to think very, very carefully about the choice to put someone out of community. I'm not talking about a blanket critique of cancel culture, holding public figures accountable for their actions, for instance. I'm talking on a very internal family level, the communities we make on this campus. Choosing to remove someone or exclude someone or even overlook someone is not a small thing given what we know about the life-affirming role that community plays. We can ask ourselves, who on our campus has access to community support and who doesn't? How can we make our love for one another more expansive and less conditional? And I'll end there, it's abrupt, but I think sometimes abrupt is good. <laughs> I hope the question nags us all a bit and we can return to it in conversations with each other after this round table is over. Thank you, Amy. Okay, I have a few more slides, but they should be easy. Um, so I'm gonna take us into one classroom, uh, and I think some of what I'll share has threads that connect many of what some of us have already talked about today. So I'm gonna take us into my 
Uh, I'm sorry, I'm Lisa Martin. I'm uh, <laughs> um, a professor in women's and gender studies and chair of health and human services. And I am teaching a cross-listed course in both of those disciplines in uh, social construction of mental illness. And so I am not a clinical person by any means. And instead, we look at issues of gender and race and stigma and how mental illness is constructed and understood by society. And so my students, as part of this class, do a research project using Photo Voice, which is a participatory research action methodology, where they take a research question, namely, what is your community doing to support people with mental illness, or what is it doing that does not support mental illness? And they get to define community any way that they see fit, right? It is their community. And many of our students choose our campus as the community that they wish to explore in this project. And so I looked over data from the last three or four years of students who chose U of M Dearborn as their campus and mined their projects to see some of what themes have been pulled out. And so students um, who have chosen our campus as their have really kind of talked about resources. Um, so some of what Sarah shared with us, right? So identifying those who know about CAPS think that our resources are underutilized. <laughs> they know themselves. They aren't using the resources that they have. They know themselves. It's not really well known. They look into it and they go, I didn't know we had all of that. Um, they think it is stigmatized, right? They don't think that they're going to walk into CAPS or that they know other students aren't going to walk into CAPS. And they worry about the accessibility of resources. Or So part of what they didn't know means that they think it wasn't well accessible. So they also, though, um, can think about their community. So they think of that one of the strengths of what they talk about is that our campus is a source of community. And so one of, they don't just talk about the stressors or the, the negatives that they see on campus, but they look at campus as a huge source of strength and community for them on our campus. And they talk about the ways that they're connected to one another and that being a student really helps them forge new connections and new relationships that shore up that support as their students. And so those are some of the themes that emerge from their photo voice projects. And part of the photo voice methodology is not just in identifying negative kind of either problems or, or resources, but also what is that next action step? What would you take to the powers that be, the policymakers and those who make changes, and propose solutions? And so some of the solutions that they have identified over the years include this is the first class where I've really thought about this. So I think maybe faculty should talk about this more in our classes. And it needs to go beyond just the syllabus. Like, yeah, maybe they did say something that first day in class, but I wasn't really stressed out the first day. And I don't remember it at the moment when I got stressed out, right? So they want us to go beyond the syllabus or beyond the Canvas course. And, and there's a difference between making something accessible on a piece of paper and feeling like it's accessible in the moment when you need it. <laughs> and so that's one of the main themes. Some of the other resources include um, making things, um, knowing that the resources are available, talking to faculty, making students more aware, some of the peer support. So they really liked the idea of having peer support available to them and just being more aware of the resources. So uh, that idea of going beyond the syllabus, going beyond the website. I think they would be thrilled, even in their wildest dreams, they did not know Therapy Dog was gonna be an option. So I think that like when I go to class on Monday and tell them that, they're gonna be thrilled beyond belief, right? So that's kind of the photo voice project in a nutshell. That was the first piece that I wanted to share. The second piece that I have done and kind of thinking about through these community things. So I was really struck with the idea of, okay, we have to do more than just, thank you, dear. Then, um, oh, okay. The other things were that um, the idea of, because of the stigma that walking into CAPS, like what do we do 
to make spaces more inviting, less clinical, waiting. So they're really interesting because they both want it to be very private because of the stigma. They don't want people to see you walking in there. But yet that space looks kind of clinical and sterile. And I don't know if I want to go in there. And so good luck. <laughs> I don't know. You know, I you know, it wants to be very inviting and lovely, but nobody can see me <laughs> going in there. Um, so that's always also fun. So I was thinking about their their check their information and so how do I then take it beyond my own syllabus and so as I started to do this I have a unit that I call my radical self care week that I do the week before we move into midterms so as the stress is ramping up into midterms we take this day that again goes beyond self care of I'm not telling you to spend money and go take a bubble bath and go get a massage or whatever those things are. And we watch some videos by um, Alicia Garza and some other, some other black feminist leaders about trying to reclaim this kind of commercialized idea of what self care movement is. But one of the simple things that I do on a regular basis is either two word check-ins or check-outs before and after class where I just kind of get this get the classroom oriented to putting your phones away and the rest of class is stressed but like we get this time together so we use the check-ins as a device to seal the room and see where we all are. And so on this day I did a two word check-in and I generated a word cloud. Um, and these are the words that the students shared. Stressed, anxious, exhausted, stress, worried, unhappy, um, OK, overwhelmed, sleepy, tired, scared, sleeping, exhausted, so-so. So-so was about the most positive word that I got <laughs> the entire day. Usually, a couple of students like want to make you feel good, and they'll kind of give you something good to go on. But that one day, I got not a single positive experience, to the point where that was probably a little shocking for me. Like Most students want to be stressed, and you'll feel that. But those, and I write them down, I always write down their check-ins because I kind of want to reflect on it and see where we're going to go. And so I looked at that list and I said, we didn't get a single one, you guys. <laughs> like, not, like, you're all feeling pretty bad. So what are we going to do with this? And they said, can we cancel class? Can we cancel the midterm? And I said, we cannot. I was like, I knew you were going to ask. And the answer is no, right? So what else are we going to do? So what are the solutions beyond taking everything away, because I know you're going to ask that, what else are we going to do? And so we started to, we can go to the next slide. So what are some of the things that we can do? So we do these check-ins, so I get to see how people are doing. And sometimes I give them prompts or questions. Sometimes I let them not repeat each other. So if somebody's given a word, they have to come up with something else. Um, sometimes I get them to tell me something they're looking forward to so it can't be doom and gloom. <laughs> but we take the pulse, right? Um, what we did on Radical Self Care Week was we did a guided meditation because sometimes I don't always feel so skilled to do them myself, but there are great guided meditations that you can have others help you walk through. So we did one on self-compassion because we were getting ready to go into midterms. And sometimes what I feel students talk about the skills that they feel like they're beating themselves up and they're so worked up about failure or not doing well on an exam. So we did this exercise on self-compassion and we talked a lot about what, what if you do? What if you bomb the exam? What if you bomb the midterm? What if it doesn't go to plan? Regardless of how much effort you put in studying and you prepped and it doesn't go well. And we talked about what would you say if you're practicing self-compassion? And what would you do if it was not you who failed, but it was the person sitting next to you and they're telling you the story that they failed? What would you say to them? Would you be way more kind to them than, your, than the self-talk that you're giving in your own head? And why is it easier to be kinder to someone else than it is to yourself? And then I said, and what do you think I'm thinking about you as I grade your exam. Do you think I'm judging you? What do you think I think of your poor effort on the exam? 
And they shared things like, well, you think I'm worthless, or you think I'm a terrible student. And I said, here's what I think. Oh, they had a bad experience on that exam. I don't think anything about your value as a person. I don't think anything about your ability to excel as a student. And I definitely don't think it says anything about whether or not you belong at this university and your ability to succeed here. And I was like, has anybody ever spoken to you about your worthiness as a student and whether you belong here before you go into midterms? And they said, no. <laughs> Why would anybody do that? And I said, well, then now they have. And maybe we should think about that, right? Like, your performance on an exam is how you performed in one moment in time. And that is all that it is. And it is not necessarily even a reflection of how much you're going to learn in this class, right? It's one measure. And so part of that is how we give our students support, right? We have to take assessments. We have these learning opportunities. And we can take different types of assessments, right? And we can have different types of learning. But what support looks like can change. And so some of the students talked about, like in the midterm they were about to take for me, it's a writing class, it's a writing intensive class. So they've, it's an essay exam. They've literally had the question since the first day of class. From can They open Canvas and I say, the midterm is up there. You can start working on it whenever you want, right? Many of them, before the midterms do, haven't looked at the midterm yet. So they said, well, I know you said it was there the first day, but I'm like really anxious and I haven't looked at it yet. And I said, well, we can take care of that when we open the exam and we read it together, right? Like now you've looked at it, so it's not so scary. So I, we also talked about how many of you are to-do list makers, right? And I had a lot of list makers in the class. And I said, and how many of you end your day by making your to-do list for tomorrow? And a bunch of them raised their hand. And I said, so we're going to stop that. And I said, instead of ending your day thinking about all the stress you have to do tomorrow, we're going to start ending the day by making a list of today's accomplishments. Because even if you didn't get done everything you wanted to do today, you got something done. Even if it was you got dressed, you went to class, you tied your shoes, you made yourself lunch. I don't care what it is. You accomplished something today. And tomorrow's list can be the first thing you do tomorrow, right? So we started that practice of coming up with accomplishments. And I was talking to a student yesterday. I interviewed a student for a research assistant job from my class. And one of my other colleagues asked them, well, what do you do to keep yourself organized? And she said, unprompted by me, at the end of the day, I make a list of all my accomplishments. <laughs> and I just said nothing, but I was really proud to hear that because she was one of my list makers <laughs> class earlier in the semester. And then the final thing I'll say is that we talked about emotions in that class. And we talked about stress. And we talked about the difference between stress and overwhelm and difficult conversations and vulnerability. And we talked a little bit about learning and discomfort. And something else that I think we need to talk about is we talked about how learning goes require students to be di uncomfortable, right? How a little bit, Caleb, you alluded to this, about how that discomfort of growth can be with you forever, even if the learning didn't go to plan, right? And that, that we require that vulnerability. So class is a safe space not to not be uncomfortable. It's a safe place to be uncomfortable. That is our goal as educators. And so being explicit about that with students is another, I think, big part of how we help them grow with that discomfort. I'll stop there. I think that's me. Can everyone hear me? Yeah. All right, great. Uh, I'm Patrick Boshane. I'm a biological anthropologist. Um, I'm not a mental health expert. <laughs> I'm just someone who cares deeply about these issues and has tried to think about it um, somewhat deeply, hopefully. Um, and 
So I have three main goals. My first goal is just to provide some statistics about the state of mental health um, struggles for faculty and students. Um, Sarah did a wonderful job, so I'm going to go through that really quickly. Um, my second uh, main goal is to um, really try to provide a few, just really just a handful of options, both at the individual level and also at the institutional level. Um, so hopefully we have uh, upper level people here listening. <laughs> uh, and then, but my main, actually my main goal for being here today is simply to lend my voice and participate in fighting stigma and talking about this in public uh, and just getting the word out. Um, I think this is a wonderful initiative that I hope continues um, in the coming years. I hope it's not a one and done thing. Um, we do have to talk about these things regularly. So that's my main focus for today. All right, next slide, please. Okay, um, so in terms of faculty, there's all kinds of research that's out there, um, lots of different numbers. Uh, you can see them up on the screen. Um, in many cases, it's you know, up to 25% uh, report being severely depressed you know, in Canada. Uh, another study later showed about 40% uh, were uh, talking about feeling really very depressed, um, sad frequently. Um, and then we have, um, in the United States, um, other studies, again, just in line with all the other ones, um, it's a really dire situation. We have a lot of faculty who are burning out, who are fighting the pressures of publish or perish, who are trying to do the best by their students, and it's just a lot. We have a lot of responsibilities. We have service expectations uh, to help run the university, and it becomes um, too much to bear for many people, especially um, for faculty who are asked to do too much. And it's very gendered, and it's very um, um, biased along um, racial lines as well, so there's a lot of factors here at play. Um, next one, please. And for students, it's um, not so great either. Um, <laughs> In fact, the, the statistics, just to summarize very quickly, because Sarah went over this, um, it's, it's worse for students overall. Both at the undergraduate and graduate levels, it's pretty bad. Um, many, many students report anxiety, um, severe depression, self-harm. Um, I experienced this, frankly, uh, myself personally in my classes this term multiple times. Students coming to me about self-harm, suicidal ideation, um, all kinds of things. This is common. So it's, you know, Talking about this is the first step to moving to um, fix these issues. So social stigma, um, from a lot of the research I was looking at, is um, one of the major barriers, and I think this was pointed out in other talks today, in people reaching out to get help. And the reason stigma is so damaging, right, is because it ultimately silences and isolates people. It makes people feel that they should be treating these issues on their own, that it's a private issue, that they should um, not reach out to others because they will be seen as um, different, as not part of the norm. Uh, they were, we are often, um, uh, people who, who want to reach out feel that they will be othered, that they will be labeled as someone different, as someone who is broken, who is not worthy, who is not normal. Um, so all of these feelings, um, you know, and these quotes here are from some articles I had, right? I, I, I must be the one that's a problem or I heard this from a student the other day when I, we were talking about mental health in class, um, this week actually. And the student says, well, you know, I think I should, I should just get over it, right? And of course, I stopped and we had a big talk about why that's a serious problem, <laughs> that that sort of um, ideology, that sort of way of thinking, right, leads you down a very lonely, very dark path. Right? So, and depression in particular, I think, especially for faculty who reach out, depression is very much seen as a failure of character as someone who wasn't up to task, someone who simply just couldn't cut it. And that's a serious problem that we have to recognize, um, especially when things like tenure right, become part of the equation. Um, next slide, please. So just for context, I pulled this quote from an article. This is from a research article um, by someone who was relating their experiences with major depression in their quest for tenure. And the whole article is about the failures of institutions, um, this, this one, a university, um, in dealing and treating people with depression um, as human beings. So just to read it in case you can't see it, right? I was breaking a key rule of academic life by breaching the barrier between personal interaction and professional discourse. I was asking my superiors to engage with me and my illness more intimately in a way that required them to see me as a whole human being. It required a willingness in them to change our relationship, and they were not willing. I was feeling isolated when we went into that meeting, 
But when confronted with their lack of reaction, I felt the sting of the stigma underpinning my disease, and that was devastating. So I'll just leave that there, because I think uh, that really highlights the nature of what we're dealing with. At the faculty level, when we struggle, in, especially for assistant professors who are not um, yet tenured, um, that pressure to publish or get kicked out is immense. Right? And when you, when you are you know, <laughs> faced with a response like this, you can imagine what that must be like. All right, next slide, please. OK. Um, <clears throat> so in terms of a few tips here, I just want to add some context, too. We do have agency in making our lives better. And I think everyone so far has spoken beautifully to this. Um, but I also want to reiterate that what I'm about to say in the, in the coming slides are not panaceas. They're not going to fix everything. Um, the critique of self-care is absolutely valid that Amy brought up, right? Um, so there's all that in mind. Um, I want to sort of have you all keep that in mind as I go through these next steps. And also, these are just a handful of things that I've grabbed over various research articles. These aren't, an ex this isn't an exhaustive list by any means. Okay, next slide. So first of all, and this is again why we're all here, you're not alone in dealing with this, right? If there's one thing you take away from this, I think that should be it, that others are feeling the same thing with you. I talk about this with imposter syndrome with students all the time. The same goes with mental illness, depression, anxiety, all of these things, right? And then also, you know, um, this is something that we face um, tremendously as faculty. Working harder or more hours doesn't mean you are being productive or useful, right? At some point, you reach a limit where you're working for the sake of working. You're not producing anything valuable or interesting or good. You are just stressing yourself out <laughs> for no purpose, right? So keep that in mind, right? And then um, I think setting boundaries, both professionally and personally, is, is really, really critical. Carving out time for yourself, for self-compassion, right? Self-care, not the commercial kind of self-care. And then finally, um, sort of building a self-care toolbox, right? So like Amy was saying and others were saying, things that work for me may not work for you, right? Exploring different ways of coping, of mitigating stress, like Caleb was saying. Um, all of these different tools um, are, can be useful in mitigating stress. They will not remove it, and nor should we remove it, as Caleb was saying entirely. Stress can lead to growth. It can lead to all kinds of things. But too much stress, like Caleb was saying, I talk about this a lot in my class, because I am an anthropologist. Okay, I'll get self -heated. Okay, We don't know what's happening. Um, I'm an anthropologist who's really excited about the interface of culture and biology and how our cultural and social lives changes our biology and affects us in profound ways, which also then changes our social lives. And it's, like, it's a feedback loop. And what Kaylee was saying really spoke to that really well, and, and that's um, really uh, exciting stuff. Now, at the institutional level, um, I think people in power should be mindful to not set potentially really unrealistic or toxic expectations for faculty. And in the current era of you know, student enrollment issues and everything else that we're facing, this could become a problem, so we have to be very cognizant of this. Uh, people in power should also model um, healthy behaviors for faculty. Right? Things like this is what we need, and, and more. Right? And then redefining achievement. I think the work that Amy described, right? all the work she puts in with her students, all the work we all put in with our students, that has to be valued in some way. Right? Uh, as institutions and universities become more corporatized, the metrics become very much about publication, research grants, and all that stuff that can be easily quantified. But all the extra effort that we put in has to have value and it has to be assessed and somehow included in things like tenure, in, in promotions, and all that sort of thing. Right? And then finally, um, you know, organizing um, uh, mentees to help um, support and, and basically try to build a culture of empathy and support rather than competition between each other right? at the faculty level is really, really critical. All right, why does this all matter? I think, you know, I'm big on empathy. <laughs> I really try and live, you know, what, what, I, what I research about this. Um, and I think building a, a, a context like this where we can empathize and build empathy for others and, and their struggles is really, really critical. And the COVID context is important here, too. We are not out of this pandemic. We are still living it. We are, I, I am seeing the effects of this in my students daily, right? So I think we cannot keep pretending like we're back to normal. We are not back to normal. It is a long way off. And also, um, finally, I'll just end on a few points that, you know, all of this undue stress and this, the mental health challenges that we face, these actually affect our ability to teach well. It affects the student's ability to retain information. 
unlike uh, Ben Shapiro would have us believe, facts do care about your feelings. A happier student, a more well-adjusted student, a one that is feeling good about themselves, they'll simply do better in school. They will know the information better, they will retain information better, they will learn better, and there's a sort of like feedback loop. They then make us <laughs> more inspired <laughs> and teach better, and it, it is a symbiotic relationship between the students and the faculty. And the, the more that we can take care of ourselves, the better we are able to take care of them. They benefit, we benefit. We are in this in the, together in that sense. So, all right, I will pass it. Is it Ben next? Yeah. <laughs> Um, so my name's Finn Bell. Um, I'm a brand new assistant professor in human services and chess. So um, I've learned a lot from you all on this panel, and there's a lot that I'm going to integrate into my own classes that my students who are here now can tell you I don't currently do. <laughs> but I think the classes would be much better if I did, so I certainly will. Um, so the things that I'm really going to talk about today um, is, um, so I guess w one of the sort of biggest organizing piece uh, of, of what I'm talking about is actually talking about hope and hope in the classroom. And um, so the slide that would be here is a quote from the Dalai Lama, which is hope is the antidote to despair. And I think so many of the mental health struggles that we see on campus and everywhere else, um, as well as a lot of um, you know, our larger political problems are all problems of despair. And um, when I say hope, as um, Rebecca Solnit says, and her book, Hope in the Dark, which there's a picture of. Um, uh, you know, hope is not the same as optimism. Hope is not just this belief that like everything will be fine and we just have to think positively about it, right? Um, I'm talking about um, what uh, Buddhist eco-philosopher Joanna Macy calls active hope, right? So active hope is a practice like gardening or Tai Chi. It's um, something that you have to cultivate. And um, she talks about three steps to cultivating active hope. The first is, um, as Patrick sort of modeled, actually, in his presentation, right? First, we have to be really real about where we are and what the situation is that we're in, including potentially how dire the situation is that we're in. So that's the first step. The second step is to think about what change you want to make, what change needs to be made, what values you want to see embodied. And then the third is actually taking action to make that change and to embody those values, right? And, um, uh, and, 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 and so all of this is, again, it's not sort of this like toxic positivity. It's actually, you know, that we are responsible for what happens. Um, it's not a hope that doesn't involve us. We have to be responsible. Um, and the reason why I'm, why I'm bringing this up is um, as, a couple other panelists have said, I think hope is also really intimately tied to meaning. Um, there's a, a quote that I'm summarizing from Václav Havel, which is, you know, hope is the certainty that something has meaning regardless of the outcome. And particularly when we're talking about these much larger problems, so I, I work on environmental justice and climate change issues, um, so certainly thinking about that, thinking about sort of the unveiling of a mainstreaming of white supremacy, you know, explicit white supremacy, um, you know, threats to democracy, like all of these are really big problems and none of us can know how they will, what will end up happening, but we can know that we're doing good, meaningful work. And I think that, that for me, that's a lot of what I try to um, encourage with students and make my classroom an environment in which we're doing. Um, and, uh, you, know, uh, you know, meaning as we know is, is and, and I should say, sorry, so I'm, I'm human services, I am a social worker, but I'm not a clinical social worker. My PhD is in social work and sociology, and I'm much more on the macro community organizing end. So take everything I say that's clinical with a grain of salt, as other people have said. But we do know that meaning is very important to mental health and mental well-being, right? As um, Viktor Frankl, you know, um, said as someone who survived concentration camp, um, you know, someone who has a why can survive almost any how. And so, you know, we know how important meaning is, but we also have to actually change those hows. We have to change the how of, we're living, of how we're living. Um, and so I wanna just talk briefly, especially as someone who's, you know, very new to this campus, um, but, you know, also I think a lot about my own experience as a student, and it, it's related to a lot of what other folks have talked about, but, so I went to college in 2001, which means, you know, a few weeks in, September 11th, 2001, happened. 
And although I was incredibly insulated from that as, um, you know, where I was and as not being someone who was targeted by the aftermath, you know, um, either, uh, it was so jarring and disorienting to feel like the whole world is falling down around you and yet you're still just supposed to show up to class and have studied and done the readings and, you know, um, and that was a really uh, disorienting experience for me, but I, as some other folks have talked about, I really internalized that. And on top of a lot of other things, you know, not all of which I'll go into, but, um, you know, I did actually end up like dropping out of college mid semester, but eventually came back, obviously, because I'm here now. But um, <laughs> so, anyways, uh, but I, I remember really just thinking that was my own failing, right? Like, what was wrong with me? Why was I so sensitive? You know, all this stuff. And it wasn't until I was actually doing my PhD at Uni University of Michigan Ann Arbor and I was uh, working for the Center for Research on Learning and Teaching, and we had sort of this uh, demand from instructors after the 2016 election when you know um, our marginalized students were really being targeted by and just in these horrible intense ways and instructors were saying what do I do like do I talk about this in class do I not talk about it in class I don't know what to do so we started developing this workshop teaching in tumultuous times and when, as I was sort of diving into the research around um, teaching and learning and about how you engage the outside world and the societal stressors as I know Pam uh, Aronson was going to talk about um, all of the research was on people who were in college during 9-11. And <laughs> it all showed that basically instructors who don't acknowledge what's happening in the outside world, it severely impacts student learning outcomes, right? And I would say also student mental health. But um, so, you know, in, in this workshop we, we developed, we really started talking about how, like, you have to acknowledge it. You have to acknowledge all of the things, you know, as, as Grace so eloquently said, right, like all the systems that students are embedded in, um, and, and it's better to do, it's of course, best to do that skillfully, <laughs> but it's better to do it than to not do it, right? And, um, and there are ways to do that skillfully. But um, I wanna also go beyond sort of acknowledging to thinking about how do we make meaning in the classroom, right? And, um, and so I, uh, some of the work that I did as a researcher, which I won't get into deeply, but I was you know, at this um, Catholic Eco Justice Center um, where you know, these people were really dedicating their whole lives to environmental work. And one of the big problems with that is of course, we have really hard feelings that come up when we think about the environmental crises that we face, right? And it's part of why burnout is so rampant in those fields and everything else. So I wanted to talk to them about you know, how do you cope? How do you, how do, you do this every day and still be okay, right? Still keep showing up. Um, and they had all those same feelings the rest of us do. <laughs> there was nothing magical. You know, they, they all talked about despair. Um, they talked about other hard feelings. But they really talked about how they active, actively cultivate hope. And the way they did that was by using three strategies. By finding community, so finding community with each other, but also finding community uh, you know, with other people who came and went through the center and with the greater web of life, um, through taking action, so as soon as they really came to terms with you know, the crises and their complicity in it, they really transformed their whole ministry to really be focused on, on ecological justice. And then practicing spirituality, right? And not religion, but practicing all kinds of diverse spiritualities. Um, and so I really think that those are lessons that I at least try to take into the classroom, right? Where, and I think that's part of why Dearborn was such a great fit for me, right? Because it is a community engaged <laughs> university, right? Where we're talking about how do we connect people with, you know, connect students with, you know, outside community folks, but also how do we build community in the classroom? And I love some of the, the practices that you were talking about, Lisa. Um, and then taking action, right? I mean, hopefully, you know, if done well, right? Practice-based learning is doing things where we are actually taking real action. People, you know, are doing meaningful projects to them. And that's why, my classes, you know, I always have the students pick the things that they really care about and that they really do want to take action on. Um, and then I love, I love that we started and we're about to end this panel with a, a you know, a meditation because um, I really have not been in a lot of institutions where there sort of is an acceptance of that. And I really, I really think that's so important. It's such a, a place of comfort and also it's such a, it helps us to remember that we're just one tiny part of a much larger whole. Um, and so I just want to close by, again, sort of echoing um, Patrick and others, but by talking about how important agency is, right? So personal agency, all, all of these practices are things that help us to reclaim agency. 
Um, personal agency is essential to mental health and mental well-being, but also collective agency is the only force that's powerful enough to actually change these conditions in which we're living. And so I think that, you know, for me, I really want to cultivate both of those things so the classroom really can be a place that, you know, nurtures hope. Um, so thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm Nehal. I'm a professor in sociology and in criminology and criminal justice. And uh, I, I read the, the uh, email and, and the description of what everybody was going to talk about today. And I think we've touched upon all the levels that Grace started with, the individual, the interpersonal community, uh, and the need for institutional change as well. Uh, between Patrick's uh, um, discussion of culture and biology, how our environment is, is profoundly shaping us, even at the physical level, uh, when it comes to stress, anxiety, and depression. Uh, Amy's description of the, the need for deep community uh, to be able to be a part of our life when it comes to our wellness. Caleb's descriptions of a clinical practice and how we can shift the way we think about uh, the manner in which we're suffering, right? Using the and statement. Uh, Lisa's description of what she's done in the classroom to, to bring wellness into it. Finn's descriptions of the relationship between hope and despair. Uh, Sarah's description of what uh, the counseling center is doing and how what they are doing can be part of a larger organization of wellness here on campus. And, and as I read all of them, I thought of a, a quote from a thinker named Jiddu Krishnamurthy. Uh, and the quote is, it is no measure of health to be well adjusted to a profoundly sick society. <laughs> and that can feel overwhelming at first, doesn't it? But if I can borrow Caleb's uh, use of and, it can feel overwhelming and we have more agency than we probably think we do in being able to create social environments that have wellness baked within them. And that's part of what has uh, it been inspiring my work over the last several years. Uh, what's been preoccupying me is what, you know, as Krishnamurthy ex talks about there, what does a society that supports our wellness look like? What principles would a society that helps us to flourish inside and feel whole look like? And in my own work, uh, I draw off of a lot of mindfulness-based thought traditions, um, primarily because my work is about the legal system, uh, a system that most people do not associate with wellness. Uh, um, I rely a lot on the thought of Mohandas Gandhi, who in his early life was a lawyer himself and looking at his philosophy of law. But I'd just like to share with you a couple of core concepts I've seen over the years that I feel are so salient to everything that we're talking about today. One is the concept of ahimsa, which uh, is a Sanskrit term where the a uh, at the beginning is sort of like saying amoral or when you put an a in front of something you're indicating the absence of it and himsha is uh, a word that could be translated as harm or injury or violence so it's indicating a minimization of or an absence of harm or injury or violence this was uh, probably the core concept in gandhi's thought he used to say that that's uh, what love in action looks like it looks like a himsha. He used to describe a himsha as the vehicle, the method by which one expresses love. And then the other concept that I'd like to share with you today is one that he popularized uh, among many other people who also popularized it, is the term sarvodaya, which means it can be loosely translated as the welfare of all. What does it mean to think about the welfare of all? I'd love to tell you a quick story. I, I don't think I'll have enough time, but long story short, um, there are many times in law when, uh, when a party, uh, particularly a corporation, will say, yes, we had to destroy this area of the environment, but we're doing the greatest good by selling our product worldwide. 
it doesn't mean much to the people who are affected or who are being poisoned by toxins that are being left in their water. So rather than pitting the interests against each other, the doctrine of Sarvodaya is asking us to look at what does it mean to look at the welfare of all? What would it mean to take water from a stream, for example, without destroying the habitat in which many people and animals and plants live? And so these two concepts um, are things that uh, have very much animated uh, my own work as I think about mental health and, and wellness on multiple levels. If we look at uh, the thought of Gandhi at the individual level, he certainly had individual practices. He would wake up every morning. He had a set of med meditation practices that he would do, things that would uh, help him to be able to, uh, as Grace was explaining, ground himself and keep himself in a, in a place of uh, peace and relaxation and ease. But as many of the panelists have explained, there's, there's these other levels. There's an interpersonal level, and uh, in law, we can see uh, something, I, I found something that Gandhi had said that I, I always uh, found touching because I never learned this in law school. Um, his quote is, I had learned the true practice of law, I had learned to find out the better side of human nature and to enter people's hearts. I realized the true function of a lawyer was to unite parties riven asunder. He was doing a case where he was uh, trying to help a f uh, people who were feuding, who were family members, but rather than taking an adversarial position, which is the usual position you take, one side gets a lawyer, the other side takes a lawyer, he tried very hard to just create a circle, you know, sitting in a circle talking about the issues because there were so many relationships at stake. It wasn't just about the one issue that these two family members were arguing about. And there's, there's a healing quality about it. There's a nourishing quality about it. And I think right now we're seeing that in the movement for more restorative justice. And I think here at the university, we're already doing that in the way that we are rethinking how to approach academic misconduct. At the Dean of Students Office, Ryan Nellums is already uh, spearheading a project uh, in the way that we rethink the way that we approach students when they may cheat on an exam to better understand what might be going on in their lives, right? Uh, maybe a punishment itself is not going to be a vehicle for self-improvement for them, right? To be able to understand whatever stresses or strains they may be going through uh, can be a much more effective approach uh, if we want to be a university of wellness. And so we can see that even at the interpersonal level, we're already doing this uh, at the Dean of Students Office. You can ask Amy about that uh, if you want more detail. Um, and then finally, we have you know, what uh, you know, uh, Amy had talked about, that, that sense of deep community, and then beyond that, the sense of ne needing institutions that will support wellness. And this is perhaps the toughest one to talk about, because we have to talk about the need for livable wages. We have to talk about the need for affordable daycare. We cannot succumb to the temptation to think that our political economy, our politics, and our legal system are something separate from our very wellness and the very ways that our bodies uh, react to the environment around us because many of those institutions m can help us reduce anxiety or depression or they can help trigger them. And in Gandhi's life, certainly nonviolent non-cooperation was a way to address many of those political and economic questions by using the vehicle of love. Um, but that's a whole other conversation. But there are, there are institutional ways to create change um, that can be done both extra legally uh, in the case of nonviolent non-cooperation as well as internally. Right now there's a, a quiet revolution happening in the law called mindfulness in law. There's a judge in Arizona who regularly does meditation practice every day and one person came to him and said, why are you so calm all the time? And he said, well, I do mindfulness-based exercises every morning. And then he started to have coworkers come in and say, can you teach me how to do that? And so there's this quiet thing happening there where the, that sense of stress in the air starts to come down. There's a police officer in Madison, Wisconsin, who is teaching her fellow police officers uh, mindfulness-based stress, stress reduction techniques in the hopes of being able to reduce the stress and reduce the tendency to want to react very quickly and perhaps with more force than what might be necessary in certain situations. There are uh, many examples like this there, where this, these quiet revolutions are happening as well. Um, and so 
I hope that ends uh, us on a, on a very positive note because being able to sit with those challenges yet also know that and we have agency and we have the ability to be able to make environments of flourishing wellness around us is a very promising way to end. And on that note, I'd like to uh, end with a guided meditation from Diana Winston at UCLA's Mindful Awareness Research Center, MARC. Uh, if anybody would like the link, feel free to let Terry or I know it. We'd be more than happy to send the link to you. And all we do is follow along with Diana. So find a relaxed, comfortable position, seated on a chair or on the floor, on a cushion. Keep your back upright, but not too tight. Hands resting wherever they're comfortable. Tongue on the roof of your mouth or wherever it's comfortable. And you can notice your body from the inside. Noticing the shape of your body, the weight, touch. And let yourself relax and become curious about your body. Seated here, the sensations of your body, the touch, the connection with the floor or the chair. Relax any areas of tightness or tension. Just breathe, soften. And now begin to tune into your breath in your body. Feeling the natural flow of breath. Don't need to do anything to your breath. Not long, not short, just natural. And notice where you feel your breath in your body. It might be in your abdomen. It may be in your chest or throat or in your nostrils. See if you can feel the sensations of breath, one breath at a time. When one breath ends, the next breath begins. Now as you do this, you might notice that your mind may start to wander. You might start thinking about other things. If this happens, this is not a problem. It's very natural. Just notice that your mind has wandered. You can say thinking or wandering in your head softly. And then gently redirect your attention right back to the breathing. So we'll stay with this for some time in silence, just a short time. Noticing our breath from time to time, getting lost in thought and returning to our breath. See if you can be really kind to yourself in the process.
And once again, you can notice your body, your whole body seated here. Let yourself relax even more deeply. And then offer yourself some appreciation for doing this practice today. Whatever that means to you. Finding a sense of ease and well-being for yourself in this day. I want to thank everybody for taking the time to join us on the panel and thank all of the panelists for their thoughtful and thought-provoking contributions to today's discussion. As Provost Scarlatta said at the beginning, this is an important topic for our campus to engage in, and this is the, just the first conversation that we'll be having throughout the year. So I hope that you'll all continue to engage with us throughout the rest of the year. And Good luck with the end of the semester, and thank you as you go along with the rest of your day. Thank you.